Well, we're going to pick up on Daniel 8. As you know, we have been looking at uh, the book of Daniel, and we've gone through chapters 1 through 7 so far. And one of the things we notice right away is that as we get into chapter 8, if you're looking at how it's written, Daniel chapter 8 is actually written in Hebrew, and the rest of the chapter is written in Hebrew. The uh, uh, chapters 1, 3 to, to 7 uh, were actually written in, uh, in Chaldean, uh, but now we, we shift focus a little bit and we see that it's uh, in, written in Hebrew. Now, one of the things to keep in mind also is that as we look at Daniel chapter 8, as it says right at the beginning of the, of the chapter, it says, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. Now, this is important because it gives us a kind of a starting point as to where Daniel was in, at this stage in his life. If we figured that he left uh, uh, his hometown of Judah somewhere around uh, 606 B.C., and when he's, uh, he's reporting on the vision here, he's no longer that spry 18 or 20-year-old. He is approximately 88 years old, a, a man of uh, extreme wisdom, a lot of years, and he is uh, 88 years young. Now think of that. Think of somebody who is 88 and still serving at the highest levels of government. Somebody who is still revered uh, for his wisdom, for his knowledge, but also for his judgment. And I'm sure in some minds he was also respected because of his love for God. So there's a, there's a lesson there. I'd like to start off with just uh, reading a little bit, uh, uh, something from the Desire of Ages, page 210, talking about Christ or judge. And this is important because as we look, as we get into parts of uh, Daniel chapter 8, we will see that there's a part on judgment and a part on the sanctuary, and we need to understand that. So in, in Desire of Ages, page 210, it is he who has encountered the deceiver and through all the ages has been seeking to wrest the captives from his grasp, who will pass judgment upon every soul. The same author, Ellen G. White, has written, Christ himself will decide who are worthy to dwell with him in the family of heaven. He will judge every man according to his words and his works. That's from Christ Object Lesson, uh, page 74. And again, uh, the same author says, Christ has been made or judge. The Father is not the judge. The angels are not. He who took humanity upon himself and in this world lived a perfect life is to judge us. He only can be our judge. Christ took humanity that he might be our judge. This refers not only to the pre-advent judgment, but also to the pronouncement of the sentence and the execution of that sentence. Now, at the very time that this pre-advent uh, judgment is in session, the little horn power, which we were introduced to briefly in chapter 7, is heard to speak great words against the Most High, uttering his most blasphemous claims. Now, an even clearer picture of what, it means, what this means is presented in the book that we're now about to open. Because Daniel 8 deals particularly with the sanctuary and God's provision of salvation for sinners. That's an important point. So to understand the message of, of Daniel fully, we must also understand something about the sanctuary, about the heavenly sanctuary. For the prophecy declared that the truth of that sanctuary would be cast down to the ground and trodden underfoot. Well, how is all of this to happen? The, this chapter, Daniel 8, could well be called the key to understanding the prophecy of Daniel. In this chapter, we'll be introduced to the vision of a ram, a goat, and a little horn that would destroy, would seek to destroy the truths of salvation. 
The vision was given to Daniel two years after the vision that was described in Daniel chapter 7. So there's a gap of roughly about 720 days using the Hebrew uh, solar uh, calendar uh, between the vision in chapter 7 and the vision in chapter 8. So let's open our, our Bibles to Daniel chapter 8 and begin our journey together as we look at what is going on. In chapter 1, we see, in the third year of the reign of King, Neb- King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel. So here is Daniel identifying himself and identifying the time frame of his vision. And he's saying, after that which appeared unto me at the first. So he's making reference to the fact this is another vision after the one that he had before. Now, it's interesting uh, that he also tells us where he was. Now, there's some debate as to whether or not Daniel was actually in Susa or Shushan or he was in vision or seeing himself in vision uh, in that uh, place. Now, this is not... um, This is not necessarily unusual because we see that there are some other examples of a prophet talking about a place but not actually being there. For example, the visit of Ezekiel to Jerusalem and that of John to the wilderness, they were not necessarily there. But we don't need to actually quibble about these points because whether Daniel was physically there or whether he was... um, Uh, just describing uh, Susha, doesn't really change the prophetic message at all. So here he was at at Shushan, or Susa. And what's so important about this place? Well, Susa, we we find, has a long history, um, and it was actually uh, first the seat of power of the Cushite race. If you look in the book of Genesis, you'll see Uh, reference to the Cushite rates or the descendants of Cush. And uh, we also know that um, this particular place um, was was the seat, uh, the summer palace of the kings of Babylon. And it was also the place where in 1901, a group of French archaeologists while uh, working there, they discovered something called the Code of Hammurabi. Have you ever heard of that? Now, the Code of Hammurabi was actually 282 laws codifying uh, the rule of Babylon under this king, Hammurabi. So we see that um, here you have Daniel, and it's very likely, given his position, that Daniel could very well have been at some point in Shushan going about the king's business. Um, But here we have Daniel, and an interesting thing about uh, Shushan is that it's actually in a place uh, called Elam. It was like the, the center point of Elam. And Shushan was important and Elam was important because later on, it kind of changed allegiances. When Daniel was there, or Daniel is talking about Shusha, he is talking about a period of time where they were still under the rule of the Babylonians. But interestingly, this group of people shifted their allegiance to Cyrus before he actually took over Babylon. So it's some interesting history there. And it says further... And I was at Shushan at the, in the palace. In the palace can also be referred to as in the citadel or in the, the place of um, it, almost like thinking of it like Shushan, the capital. That's another way of saying in the palace. And I saw in vision and I was by the river of Ulai. Now, Ulai is one of those uh, rivers. And if you look at some historical uh, information, it's actually considered a canal between two major rivers that flowed in that uh, particular area. Uh, some scholars see it as that canal between the Chuaspes and the Chapatris rivers. 
Now, continuing on, so we have an idea of the geography, we have an idea of the time frame that this vision is taking place. And Daniel goes on in, in verse 3 to say, Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. Now, remember, we're starting again to look at that part where there's the, the principle of prophetic uh, um, understanding or interpretation of repeat and expand. So we've encountered some of these uh, uh, people before. And I saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. And the two horns was high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. Who have we seen before that this is a description of? The Medes and the Persians, right? It was that uh, conglomerate, the Medes and the Persians, and the Persians were actually the ones that uh, superseded. They became the stronger section. But it's interesting, despite them taking over and, and to some degree conquering the Medes uh, a little bit later on, history shows that they didn't treat the, the, the Medes as inferior or as servants, but they actually saw them as confederates. But here you have this ram, uh, representing the Medes and the Persians. And, um, and we see that the ram was pushing westward and northward and southward. So since you're students of the compass, if something's pushing westward and northward and southward, where is it coming from? It's coming from the east, Absolutely. And it goes on to say that so no beast might stand before it, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. Now, when it's talking about pushing westward, we see that uh, Cyrus, one of the, uh, the Persian kings, he conquered Lydia, which was in the south, in about 547 B.C., and Babylon in 539 B.C. Now, remember as you looked at the prophecies, it talks about the Medo-Persians being great, the next kingdom being very great. Well, the Medo-Persians actually had a larger territory than the ones they conquered. And who did they conquer? Babylon, right? So the territory that they controlled. And we see that the Persians army was so successful in how they uh, conquered territory that when we encounter the name of Ahasuerus, a name that you might be familiar with if you've ever read the book of Esther, he was the, uh, the king at that time, the, per the empire extended from India all the way to Ethiopia. Think about that. And so this was the extent of the then known world and um, an interesting thing is that the title of the Persian kings, they were referred to as king of kings or king of the countries. Where have we heard that phrase, king of kings, before? And it says that they became great or that they literally um, magnified themselves and became more powerful. And verse 5 and as I was considering, this is Daniel's way of saying, as I was thinking about what I had just seen, behold, a he-goat. And in some translations, it's referred to as a hairy goat or a shaggy goat. Um, came from where? We see that uh, Persia came from the east. So here you have this goat coming from the west and covering the face of the whole earth, and touched not the ground. As we saw earlier in, uh, in, in the previous uh, chapter, we see that this is referring to the speed with which Alexander conquered uh, the country. He moved literally not touching the ground, suggesting the speed so fast that it, uh, it didn't touch the ground. And it says here, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Now, 
if you flip to verse 21, you're actually given uh, the answer to who this notable horn was. This notable horn represented the first Grecian king. And who was that? Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. And, um, and he came to the ram that had two horns, in verse 6, which I had seen standing before the river and ran into him with the fury of his power. Have you ever seen any of these National Geographic programs where you have these rams on a hill, these sheep with the big horns, and they kind of back up and they lower their heads and they come charging at each other with uh, full speed and clash into each other? So you can kind of have a, a representation of what was happening here. This, uh, this he-goat came into the, to the ram with the full fury of his power. And just to give you an idea of what that full fury it really refers to, it says in verse 7, And I saw him, this is talking about the goat, come close unto the ram, and he moved, I love words, and he moved with collar. Have you ever heard the word collar? Think of, have you ever heard of the disease cholera? It's like you're, you're enraged with fever. But here when you just use the term collar, it's actually an old English word that means anger, intense, unabated anger. And it came with him with anger and smote the ram and broke the two horns. What is this suggesting? That the, the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, it was broken. But it just doesn't say that it was broken, but it says that this poor little ram who had been such a power before had no power to stand before the goat, but he cast him to the ground, knocked him over, cast him to the ground, and for good measure, what did he do next? He stamped on him, okay? Now, if you've ever uh, done that, something has, some little pest or whatever has, has bothered you, whether it was a, a bee or a hornet that came your way and you swatted it and it hit the ground, do you just let it sit there? <laughs> I've seen many times, I've done it many times. <laughs> you kind of use your foot and you make sure that that's the end of it. Well, here you get get that same idea that uh, the goat hit him, broke him, cast him to the ground, and stamped on him. And here's an important point. And there was no one around that could prevent this from happening. It said there was no one that could deliver the Medes and the Persians out of his hand. Now, as we see what's going on here, we notice that the, the he-goat, who represents Greece, the kingdom of Greece, it says he waxed very great. Now, remember, that's something we've seen before when talking about the prophecies. The Medes were great. The kingdom of Greece was very great. Okay. Now, if something's great they're big. If something's very great, it suggests that it is bigger, even bigger. But here's something very, very interesting that is borne out by history. Even if somebody is an agnostic, an atheist, that they read this account, they're familiar with history, they see that it's borne out because it says and when he was strong. Now remember we're talking about the king of the of the Greek the Grecian kingdom. And who was that king again? Alexander. And it says and when he was strong. When do we usually associate strength? Do we usually associate that with an infant? Do we usually associate that with a uh, somebody who is uh, very old? It's usually somebody in what many times has been called the prime of their life. By the way, I represent the new prime. Just kidding. Um, 
But here you have the notion, and when he was strong, or when he was in the prime of his life, the great horn, Alexander, was broken. Now, we step aside from, from the Scripture and we look at history. And we know that Alexander, at the age of 32 or 33, had conquered the then-known world. He had actually gone as far as uh, the Indus River, uh, and uh, his troops finally said after seven years of constant battle, we're not going any further. We don't care who you are, Alexander. This is it. We want to go home. And so he actually started uh, his journey back and reached as far as Babylon. But it's, it's said, as you look at different historical pieces, it says that he encountered and came down with a variety of swamp fever, which has sometimes been referred to as malaria, but also because he was also involved in what we can kindly call a bit of intemperance. He was uh, drinking very heavily. He, he died very shortly thereafter. But before he died, and this is important as we uh, begin to look at what happens in verse 9, before he died, uh, a very close friend of his who has been identified historically as a character called Perdiccas, Perdiccas, said to him, Alexander, my liege, I love that phrase, my liege, who shall you give the kingdom to, or who shall have the kingdom? Because clearly Alexander was on his last legs on his way out. So Alexander said to him, to the strongest. Now, that wasn't a very clear answer because think about it. If you're one of Alexander's generals who has just conquered the world, everybody knows who you are. Can you imagine in the age of uh, um, cell phones? Everybody would know who Alexander was. Everybody would know who the generals were. But bef in this most, there was strife going on, striving for power. Initially, Alexander's son... Uh, and he had a son, incidentally, by, the, by a woman by the name of Roxana. You know any Roxanas? Um, but, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was king right after, and then two other sons, but they were never able to keep the kingdom together. They were never able to have the, the management, the style, the charisma, and the glue-like quality of their father, Alexander, so pretty soon what happened is that all of the generals began to vie for power. And there were many, many generals. You can imagine, on a worldwide campaign, you had many generals. But after a period of time, it came down to four principal generals. And let's see what uh, chapter 9. Remember, this is all from history. Somebody that's not a biblical student, we're now down to four generals vying for supremacy in the kingdom that, that was splintered and that had been left behind. Let's see what chapter, verse 9 says. And out of one of them, uh, well, before that, back up to verse 8, sorry. And when he was strong, the great horn Alexander was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of the earth. Now, this is significant because the four notables that are talked about there, and we've looked at them uh, briefly in the past, but you have four, four of the generals. One who took the northern part of the kingdom was Lysimachus. Lysimachus, not, not Lysol, but Lysimachus, okay? He took the northern part. Then there was uh, another general named Seleucus, and he took the eastern part, and the eastern part uh, included Babylon, Persia, and Syria. Uh, the north, just to kind of give an idea, included uh, Asia Minor, Cappadocia. And then there was a, a general named Ptolemy. He took the south, and the south included Egypt, Cyprus, and Palestine sometimes referred to in Scripture when it talks about Palestine, it makes reference to Palestine as 
the, uh, the pleasant land. So anytime you see that notion of the pleasant land, it's referring to Palestine. And then the last of the four generals was uh, somebody named Cassander, and he took the west, excuse me, and, and the west included Greece among others. So here you see that as we move on in verse 9, excuse me, and out of one of them came forth a little horn, a little horn. And when it talks about out of one of them, there's a great deal of confusion that has arisen about, well, out of what? Out of which one? But as we, as we look at it, we find out that um, this little horn and, um, is referring to that power that begins to come up. And we've seen that power referred to in, in previous uh, chapters. Who was that power that came up after Greece? Rome, okay? And we see that um, it, it talks about this, this little horn which waxed exceeding great. Now, as we've looked at before, pardon me, as we've looked at before, We've seen that uh, the Medes and Persians were considered great. The, uh, the next kingdom, the Grecian or Greek kingdom, was considered very great. And here you have in verse 9, this little horn power referred to as being exceeding great. And uh, one of the ways that we have an understanding where this power came from Remember the four kingdoms that I just talked about at the four corners? Think of it as a compass, north, south, east, and west. Well, let's look if the verse 9 gives us any idea where this little power is coming from. Out of which of those four powers is it coming from? It waxed exceeding great toward the south. So that means it didn't come from the south. It uh, waxed exceeding great toward the east, didn't come from the east, and toward the pleasant land. And as we have already seen, the pleasant land is in the southern uh, part of the kingdom. So we, we get an idea here, we get an idea here that this is coming out succeeding the Greek kingdom, the Greek kingdom. It's important to, to recognize also that um, in as much as the vision of, of chapter 8 closely parallels the prophetic outlines in chapters 2 and 7, and in as much as in both of those outlines, the power that succeeds Greece is Rome, the reason of, reasonable assumption here also is that this power that succeeds this little horn power of verse 8 also applies to Rome. Now, this little horn, it represents Rome in both its phases, both the pagan phase and also the papal phase. Daniel saw Rome first in its, uh, papal, in its pagan phase, in its uh, imperial phase, and he saw them warring against the Jewish people and also against the, the Christians, the early Christians. And then in its papal phase, as he continued in his vision, he sees this, this little horn also warring against the people of God all the way into the future. So it's the little horn is a power that's warring against God and his people. Now, we have an understanding, just to give a little better understanding of why we feel uh, that this is describing Rome. When it says uh, in verse 9, toward the south, it's important to realize that Egypt was long an official protectorate of Rome. 
her fate was already in Rome's hand by about 68 BC, 168 B.C., when uh, one of the kings called uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, you may have heard of him, um, who was seeking to, wa- to make war on the people of Egypt, was warned by Rome not to do that. Don't do that. This is our land. And so he turned him back. Now, why is this fellow Antiochus Epiphanes important? Because there is a real attempt to define him as the little horn. But he occurred way before Christ came on the scene. And as we see a little bit later in the chapter, the little horn would make war against the prince of heaven. Who is this prince of heaven? It's none other than Jesus Christ. And also, when we think about it, the little horn is described as being exceeding great. But Antiochus Epiphanes was only the, one of the kings in the Seleucid or the Eastern Kingdom. He was not greater. He was just one of many kings in one part of the kingdom. Does that seem like exceeding great, bigger than Greece? Not at all. And it says toward the East and the Seleucid Empire... Um, lost its uh, lands to Rome as early as 190 B.C. And finally, the Roman province of Syria fell in 65 B.C. As we've said before, Palestine or the Pleasant Land, this was also incorporated into the Roman Empire about 63 B.C. Now, as we look and we see that here is this little horn... And verse 10 goes on, and it waxed great, even to the host of heaven. Daniel is still here describing what he saw in that vision. And so, if you look at verse 24, we're not left in darkness concerning the significance of what is described in verse 10. The host and the stars obviously represent the mighty and the holy people. And it says here, it waxed great, and it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. So it, it sought to minimize or neutralize or wipe out some of the host or the holy people of God. And not only did it uh, uh, want to wipe them out, but it did something that uh, you see earlier mentioned that the, um, the ram, I mean the goat did to the ram, After he had thrown it down, what did he do? He stamped on him. So here you have a pattern going on. And when we think about stamping on somebody, we're thinking about the ongoing fury that was unleashed on the people of God who were persecuted so often throughout the centuries. We see this demonstrated in Nero. Heard of that fellow? We see it demonstrated in the emperor Diocletian. We see it, and these are all in in pagan times, but we also see that Rome has never failed to also deal harshly with the people of God in its uh, papal phase. Rome goes after those who don't subscribe to its message. And it says here in verse 11, remember it talks about this little horn would seek to say great things against the Most High. And so verse 11 says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. What is he trying to do? Elevate himself, supplant himself, uh, identify that he's taking over. This reference of prince of the host is none other than Jesus Christ, who was crucified under the authority of Rome. And then it gets a little bit interesting here in verse 11. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now many commentators uh, have identified that that word sacrifice was actually not part of the original text but was put in there 
by the translators who thought that this was making reference to the sacrifice in the sanctuary system that had been in place. But more accurately, when you see that word daily, it actually is referring, if you look, if you go back and look at the Hebrew word, tamid, any Hebrew speakers here? But if you look at the word tamid, which is the Hebrew word for daily, it actually means more specifically continually or continual. Continually or continual. So this gives an idea. It means continually, such as continual employment, permanent sustenance, continual sorrow. But more specifically, when we look at it and how it's used frequently in connection with the, with the sanctuary, it's describing various features of the regular services of the sanctuary. Consider this. The continual bread that was to be kept upon the table of the showbread. The, um, the lamp that was to burn continually. The fire that was to be kept burning upon the altar the burnt offerings that were to be offered daily, continually, continuously, the incense that was to be offered both morning and evening. The word itself, therefore, does not mean daily, as we understand daily, but continually. And really, of the 103 occurrences in the, in the um, Old Testament where that word tamid, translated daily, occurs, only five times is it translated daily. And those five times are in Daniel. Now, that's interesting if we look at what potentially may be happening here to pull us away from the real significance of what the, the word daily means. Now, the translators of the King James Version obviously believe that by putting in the word sacrifice after daily, it, they were believing that the burnt offering was the subject of the prophecy. But that daily or that continual is actually in reference to the original of the temple. Remember the temple on earth, both in the wilderness and ultimately when they built that temple in Jerusalem, Solomon's temple, was a type of what was in heaven, a type of what was in heaven. So here you have that uh, the daily was supposed to remind the people of God in his sanctuary up above. And it says here, and the daily was taken away, that notion of focusing on Christ as our Savior, focusing on Christ who died once for all. Now, this was substituted by a different system where you had the center of religion was placed in Rome and the development of a, the notion of an earthly priesthood where you had to go through the priesthood for remission of sins, for asking for forgiveness, and the celebration also of a daily mass where the notion was that Christ was dying daily. That is not a biblical uh, understanding at all. Christ died once for all. His sacrifice was once. Not this notion of an ongoing, perpetual uh, sacrifice. Now you have some, some really devout Bible students that also assign additional meaning to the word daily. For example, some students consider that the daily refers to that period of paganism. Um, another devout, equally devout Bible students refer to the priestly ministry of our Lord as representing uh, daily. Now, as with other difficult passages of Scripture, uh, our salvation is not dependent on our understanding the meaning of that word daily. It helps if we knew it, but it doesn't completely um, knock us out. Let's look on a little bit further. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. In other words, the worship, uh, the focus on 
the earthly being a representative of what was happening in heaven. And we know that the sanctuary is where Christ is ministering on our behalf. And just as the sanctuary here on earth had a holy and a holy place, the sanctuary in heaven, which is the original, has a holy and a most holy place. Now, as we look further, and it says, and a host, in verse 12, a host or an army was given him against the daily by reason of transgression. Now, what is this referring to? It's indicating that uh, it's talking about the multitudes of people, the hosts that fell under the influence of this power, this little horn power. But it also indicates that this power would become very powerful, very mighty. And then there's an interesting part that it talks about. It would become powerful, but not by his own power. If you look at Daniel 8.24. The papacy, uh, it's talking here, and it cast down the truth to the ground. One of the things that we have seen over time is that uh, this little power would load the truth and tradition and obscure it by superstition by the veneration of saints, by the worship of, uh, uh, by believing in I- immortality. It would talk about uh, different things like penances, where you could literally buy your way into salvation. Now, and it practiced and prospered. Have we seen the little horn power grow phenomenally? Have we seen its influence spread to the four winds of the earth. Now, why it's important to really be aware and study Bible prophecy and understand it fully for yourself, there is a full movement afoot right now to say that this little horn power is actually centered and will be centered in the Middle East and that it represents uh, the Islamic uprising and power. And there are some people that really subscribe to the notion because they see that there has to be this Armageddon taking place in the Middle East, and so they're actually believing that this is going to be how it unfolds. But here we we have, if we understand and we see the flow of history, we see the fact that uh, Scripture supports the notion of the development of who is the power Don't forget that principle of repeat and expand. We see in Daniel 2, we see in Daniel 7, we see in in Daniel 8 again that it it follows that progression from Babylon to the Medes and Persians to the Greeks to the Rome, okay? Both in its um, pagan and in its um, papal powers. And then it, uh, verse 13 begins, takes us in another direction, and it says, I heard one saint speaking, but it's not said what that that saint said, but it clearly was something that got his attention. And another saint said unto that one who spake, how long shall be this vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation? In other words, how long is all of this stuff going to happen where the people of God are being oppressed? where things are just, uh, uh, sin is just magnifying over and over again. Interesting, when you look at verse 14, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days. Now, some people, to again try to get away from the biblical principle of uh, a day for a year, they look at this and they say, well, really, it says evening, morning. That's just half a day. So they try in so many ways to to say that just represents half of 2,300 or 1,150 days. And they try to squeeze it in to figure something about that. But there is 
in the Jewish mind, when the Jews read an understanding of the evening and morning, where have we come across that before? Right in the story of creation, right? The evening and the morning were the first day. It didn't say the evening morning was half a day, and the rest of the day you had to do whatever you wanted. So this notion of, um, of the commentators that have tried, but without success, I tell you, to find some event in history that would fit um, a period uh, subscribing to that 1150 days. The only way that we can have that consistency of the 2300 days is if we apply that biblical principle of a day for a year when referring to prophetic material. Now, the time um, that says here, it's interesting when you look at verse 14, because uh, one of the things that we see and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary, there's that notion of the sanctuary again, be cleansed. That word for cleansed, uh, it can also be translated more accurately as be justified, be made right. What is it that needs to be made right? What is it that needs to be justified? What, what is on trial in this universe? God's character. God's character. So the cleansing of the, of the sanctuary represents that, uh, that, that restoring to that righteous uh, state. And it came to pass when I, Daniel, in verse 15, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice behind, between the banks of the Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Have you ever wondered who it was that was talking to Gabriel? None other than Jesus Christ. Jesus, this was such an important prophetic concept that it was left to no one but Jesus Christ himself to say about the 2300 days. And so he came near where I stood, and when I saw him, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said, understand, O man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. So here is Daniel, really uh, completely perplexed by all of the things that are happening. He knows that this is a very important uh, piece that has been told to him, but he doesn't quite understand it. Uh, it says in verse 15 that he sought for, uh, for meaning. But here comes Gabriel. And where have we encountered Gabriel before? Do you know Gabriel is the one that actually took somebody else's place? Whose place did he take? Lucifer's place. What place did Lucifer occupy? Lucifer was the chief angel or chief cherub. So he took the place of Lucifer who was referred to as the angel of light. So here we have Gabriel. And by the way, in the Old Testament, the name Gabriel only occurs twice. Once right here in Daniel um, 8, verse 16, and the second time in Daniel 9, 21. But we're familiar with this character, Gabriel. Because we, we see that he also was the heavenly being who came to announce the birth of John the Baptist. Remember that? He was also the one that announced to Mary the birth of the Messiah. And uh, he had declared, I am Gabriel. And here's his title. I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. Think of how powerful that is. So Gabriel occupied that position from which Satan fell. Gabriel was also the heavenly agent that relayed the prophetic messages to someone else. Who was that? John the Revelator. So 
when Gabriel says, uh, listen, this is for the time of the end, he was talking about the, the power of this little horn would continue for a long period of time, and it would continue until this desolating power, referred to earlier when we, when we talk about the fact of um, um, the transgression, it's referring to putting an end to this power who has caused corruption and has caused problems all throughout history. And, uh, but he says, the last events represented in the, in the vision, this is Gabriel, will be fulfilled at the end of the world's history. And, it, and this must be borne in mind when we're seeking an interpretation of the symbols of the vision. And as we continue on, as we see uh, Daniel, he is <laughs> almost like he's uh, in a deep slumber. But the angel Gabriel touched him and set him upright. And he said, look, I will let you know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. That's just another way of saying what they just said in, in verse 17, at the end of time, at the end of history. Um, um, and then it, as we go on through the rest of the, the chapter, it really refines and gives us some specific information as to some of the things that happened before. Verse 20 leaves no doubt, if we had any, as to who this ram was. It identifies the ram with the two horns as being the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat or the he goat is the king of Greece. And that great horn that is between the eyes of the rough goat is the first king Alexander. Now that being broken, talking about Alexander in verse 22, whereas four stood up for it, and as we've seen before, those four kingdoms that ultimately came out of the four generals who were able to prevail, shall stand up out of the nations, but not in his power. In other words, these four that came up would in no way resemble the majesty or the power or the domination of Alexander. Verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance. Now we see a similar reference made of uh, fierce countenance uh, described in Deuteronomy, where uh, this this power this was so so intimidating so fearful and uh, in here it's referring since we've followed that progression who follows the kingdom of greece it's this king of fierce countenance this king of magnificent power but also uh, terrible intent and understanding dark sentences in other words, mysteries, uh, putting things in place that are not easily understood but are fully expected when you tie it in with a fierce countenance, are fully expected that you obey and follow. Remember that, that idea, and we've seen it through the history of the Roman Empire, both in its pagan and in its uh, papal components. We see that those that don't subscribe to the way that it sees and interprets things, were wiped out. And here you see an understanding dark sentences. With that dark sentences, some commentators also imply that that means that uh, the, the Jewish people and the Christians couldn't understand this new power who was centered in Rome and who spoke Latin. The previous, the previous uh, powers, the Medes and Persians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, all of these were languages that the, the nations around and uh, the people of Judah also spoke these languages. But here we have a different power. And this power shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not in his own power. 
What are you extracting from that, but not in his own power? Here you see that um, a reference to the fact that the papacy, as it began to grow, and remember it didn't just speed up right after the disintegration of Greece. It was a gradual process where the civil power uh, was actually became subservient to the religious power. And we see that uh, throughout history. We see the notion that uh, people that were not religious were ushered in and became bishops and uh, different leaders of the church. And the leaders of the church became rulers over certain segments of the country. Regardless of their ecclesiastical ability or their ability to, to make good decisions and to be prudent in their decisions. And it says, but not in his own power. And so ultimately we see that this little horn began to take control over the civil and the religious matters of the world. And you know, it's interesting, as a, a historical note, in A.D. 1800, Charlemagne, heard that name? He was the king of the Franks. The Franks was one of those ten kingdoms that we looked at earlier. And actually, when you think of the Franks, you think of the French, right? The Franks actually are, the French are now the modern-day Franks. But in, in that period of time, it was Charlemagne that declared the Holy Roman Empire. And it was his function and his purpose to bring people together. If I have to, to whip you, to shoot you, to kill you, it's going to happen. But it was all to bring everything under one power and to bestow ecclesiastical authority under one person. So you see that uh, these things are beginning to happen and through policy and craft. Policy usually refers to what? Laws, structure, administrative type of rule. They made decisions to bring people into control. But they also use craft. When you hear, hmm, somebody's using craft, what is that suggesting? They're being sly, underhanded, uh, sneaky. But the purpose is you will conform. You either do it willingly under uh, policy, or we will uh, bring you in under craft. And it says here in, uh, in verse 25, and through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. We're, we're warned in the scripture, be, be careful, be aware when somebody says, peace, peace because it's at that point that desolation will be upon you. So here you have, uh, it's really saying by peace, or when people feel that they're living at ease, they will be destroyed unawares. And he will try to stand up against the prince of princes. Who is this referring to? Christ, absolutely. It's, same uh, person that we saw in verse 11 designated as the prince of the hosts. And it goes on, but he, referring to this little horn, shall be broken without hand. Now that's very important, and we're coming to the close here. But that's very important because we've seen that all these kingdoms have used power, force, uh, uh, armies, and so on, but right here, we see that this exceeding great power, this little horn power, is going to be broken without hand. Where have we seen that first idea int introduced? Remember in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, what happened to that statue? Okay. And the vision of the evening and the morning, and Daniel is putting that in, as a reminder, evening and the morning, to prompt people again, we're talking about a whole day, we're talking about that period, is true. Wherefore, shut up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Daniel didn't understand it. The uh, Gabriel 
Uh, under instruction from God, we don't have the reason why he didn't give him that explanation right away. Daniel had to sit on this for a while. How many times do we have to sit and think about something? We certainly want it right away, but spiritual things are spiritually discerned. You have to contemplate it for a period of time. And in closing, verse 27, Daniel was overcome. He was fainted and sick certain days. And afterwards, he rose up and went about the king's business and was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Daniel wanted to know. You want to know. We will find the answer to that question about the 2300 days in the next chapter Daniel 9. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for guiding us through this uh, very brief study. It requires uh, incredible in-depth uh, review to fully grasp and understand the many things that you've put there for us. Give us the perseverance and uh, touch our hearts with wisdom so that we will grasp the message or messages that you have for us. Please be with us as we uh, depart, and uh, thank you for your love. Amen.